Yeah, shall I, shall I get started? Or is it, it's not quite a long time yet. It's, 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 all right. Uh, all right, so uh, I'm going to be talking about the Julia debugger. As a disclaimer, this is very recent work, and by very recent, I mean like this morning at 2 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a demo prepared that I hope will not crash. Um, but if it does, uh, please bear with me. Um, a lot of the work on this has been back-end work, fixing LLVM, fixing things in Julia, like porting Julia to LLVM 3.5, which has a pretty significant break in the JIT API, and doing all of that. So I, I've been working on that this past year with the goal of being able to do all of this. And um, the patches that I wrote to LLVM got merged on Tuesday. And <laughs> right after that, I started working on the uh, the front end stuff that I'm going to be demoing today. So while you see the front end stuff, keep in mind that even though the, fr the front end stuff is what I'm showing off, it's not actually the work that I'm presenting on. But what I want to present on is the work that I'm going to be doing. So this is a very, a very different talk, uh, which is also why I don't have slides, because I have nothing to present on other than the demos <laughs> I wrote over the past couple of days. Um, all right. But before I, before I get to the demos, I put three points up there that I want to talk about, which I find important. Um, the last two are demos, but the first one is the what I want to do with the Julia debugger. And I've over the past couple of months, I've thought quite a bit about debugging, uh, mainly because I've spent a lot of time in a debugger, and I just, uh, yeah, I just spend 90% of my time in a debugger. So really, um, what a debugger basically is, is it's supposed to be a tool that helps you answer questions. And most of the, quest most of the time, this question is why. Like, why did my code crash um, is most probably the question I ask most often. But also, like, why is this the wrong color? And there has been some uh, other approaches to like, um, trace through your program code and do that kind of stuff. Um, but I, I think current debuggers, like system level debuggers, is they don't really answer that kind of question. Like you can go into your program and you can look around, but they don't help you answer this question. And I think it's a problem and I, I think it needs to change. Um, so basically what I want to do with the Julia debugger is not only build a standard traditional debugger that like allows you to step through your code, but I want to build a platform that allows you to do this more fancy kind of analysis. There's been a lot of research in machine learning types approaches to uh, finding bugs in your program, like tracing program execution and finding an anomalous program execution. But you can't find any of this in the current debuggers. Like they're not in a GDB and they're not in LDB and you won't be able to use them. But I'm hoping that if I'm able with this project to abstract away all of that, that people will be able to build really cool stuff on top of Julia. Now, there's a few things that I need to do in order to be able to do that. Uh, the first thing is I really want to turn around the notion of a scripting language for debugging. So uh, as you may know, currently GDB and LLDB both have uh, Python scripting. So what you can do is you can basically use Python to feed commands into your debugger. And it's, it's slightly more fancy than that. But it's not quite what I want to do. I want, I want to turn that around. I basically want to make the Julia API to the back end, the fundamental thing, and then using all of the REPL infrastructure that we have in Julia, um, build, a, build a debugger on top of that. And not necessarily just a REPL debugger, as you might use GDB or LLDB, but any of the IDE integration should just sit on top of that and reuse all of that. So the approach I'm using to do this is basically I'm taking LLDB which is LLVM's debugger. And I'm throwing away most of the front end, but keeping the back end that interacts with the operating system um, that can debug processes and do all of the heavy lifting. So that's basically uh, what I'm doing. I'm, ta I'm taking this debugger. Um, so right here on the left is, uh, so that this is where I get to the demo part. And I'm going to explain some more of how this manifests in what I'm going to demo uh, just in a very So right here on the left is um, uh, the working title of the debugger, which is thoughtcrime.jl. Uh, 
subject to change, but I no, might keep it. Uh, all right, so uh, what I did here is actually, uh, so this is actually a Julia program that uses the base REPL code, uh, which, uh, so my, my new REPL code actually was originally written for the debugger, and then backported into base and used as the REPL. So basically what this is, it's, a, it's another REPL pane. Like you, you know the shell mode and you know the help mode. Well, here's the debug mode. And I can actually show you that because if I press uh, the back tick key, it actually changes to a Julia prompt. Can you clear the screen so it's up on the Yeah. some reason it wasn't working the first time I hit it. So. All right, so um, yeah, so it changes back to the Julia prompt and you can change it back to the, uh, it, it works the same way as the shell mode, right? Like Julia mode here is like shell mode would be in a usual Julia record. So basically what this is, it's actually, uh, uh, it's actually LLDB. So I took the LLDB back end and right now I'm just parsing in what I'm passing from the command line and feeding it right in the LLDB command interpreter um, and getting the output. I, I want to replace that eventually to have a more native Julia interaction because a lot of the stuff you do in LLDB isn't necessarily relevant for Julia. Uh, but for right now, for this demo, that's actually uh, an LLDB prompt. But I'm not using any of the LLDB prompting code. This is REPL.jl. So I, wa I wanted to show that I can actually integrate the back end with front end Julia. So, uh, now we can get to some of the cool stuff. So uh, this is LDB. Uh, now I'm going to start a, a, another Julia process that I'm going to be debugging. So uh, upstream. Okay. Oh yeah, and the reason my Julia might seem slower than your usual Julia is because I'm. This is LLVM debug mode with all optimizations disabled, just because I need to debug into LLVM so often that it doesn't make much sense for me to have that on. So if, you were, if I were to run it with optimizations on, it would run quite a bit faster. Uh, just a bit. All right, so um, I'm going to be debugging this. So what you need to do is you need to do, um, uh, in LLDB, you would do um, uh, you would do process attach um, dash dash pit and whatever the process ID is. So I'm just going to quickly find that out. Yeah, I can do that too. All right, let's see. Uh, <laughs> Sorry? Uh, oh, we, we do have that? Yeah. Even easier, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Is this the response of yes? That This is very much, I, I wanted to show this off, but it's not ready, which is <laughs> why. Which is perfect for this conference. <laughs> it, it is, yes, I, I would not give this talk at any other conference. But <laughs> people wanted to see this, so I gave in and agreed to give this talk. All right, so let's see. Sheet sheet. This is a very example of just like you Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, no, it's, it's not target attack.
backup plan, I'm just going to use LDB directly. I'm good at that. <laughs> oh, I know what it is. terminal when I made it bigger, which actually, so on, on Mac what happens is that they added a code signing thing and then the debugger writers just went ahead and created a process that has all the privileges that you can talk to over a socket, but you need to set the path to it. That's why it, it didn't work. Sorry, I opened a new window and forgot to set the environment variable. Um, but while it's loading up, um, basically I, I can talk about how it's working. So I said that I'm using I said that I'm using the LLDB backend, um, but the only problem with that is that the LLDB backend is actually written in C++, which notoriously is very hard to call from Julia. So LLDB itself actually has a has a decent C API that you could use, um, but LLVM doesn't, and uh, back to the point of me wanting to be able to do these more fancy kinds of things, I also want to be able to do a lot more code gen uh, directly with LLVM. And for that, I need C++. So what I'm actually doing here uh, behind the scenes is I'm using Clang to turn my Julia AST into a C++ AST, then combining that to LLVM, and then executing that. So as part of this, I wrote basically a C++ foreign function interface for Julia, which I'll be demoing right after the debugger. <laughs> so it's and it, again, it's only t taking this long because it's about 20x slower because it's compiled with LLVM debug and no optimizations. Um, yes? Why does the debugger need to do code gen? Uh, well, so the, it's, it's actually a good question. So GDB added code gen very late in the process. So basically, you want to do expression evaluation. And for expression evaluation, you need to be able to do code gen. And both GDB and LLDB now do some form of code gen in the target process for expression evaluation. I want to take that a little further. I actually want to be able to modify the code generated by the child Julia process to like be able to insert lightweight checks to do all this kind of um, <coughs> Uh, analysis that you could do and basically be able to dynamically de-optimize if you set if you set a breakpoint in a function right your debug info might not be great but to enable the kind of workflow I want to be able to dynamically de-optimize that function in the target process uh, for which I need code gen and it's uh, I'm not quite there which is why I didn't talk about it but uh, I really want to be able uh, to do that kind of stuff uh, and that's why I need code gen Right, so that that should have worked. Hopefully, I can get back to my demo. So, yes, I, I, I apologize. I apologize. I got this working this morning at 2 a.m. Uh, all right, let's try that again. Okay, that looks more promising. It's taking time. I always like it when it takes time. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yes. Great. Okay. That was the that was the agent. I successfully, I successfully actually attached to this Julia process. So I'm now using that Julia process uh, to debug this Julia process, uh, which is good. So uh, we stopped at the REPL. So let's do a quick backtrace. Scroll up a little. All right. Uh, you may not recognize most of these functions because like, there's libub up here and then there's a bunch of Julia C code. But what I do want to point out is there's these uh, Julia underscore wait function, uh, Julia underscore wait, Julia underscore process event. And it actually shows them in the Julia code. So uh, in a, if you are on LLVM 3.5 and actually on current Julia master, we are generating the appropriate debug info 
to be able to do this kind of feedback. Like that was a lot of the back end work that I did was make it, making this work. So I can I go to show this up. Okay. Uh, okay. So I, I stepped into frame 11 and it says this is the Julia read function. Um, it actually shows me the arguments to it. That's what I'm currently working on, being actually able to debug local variables. It kind of works, but LLVM's variable tracking is very bad, especially when you're using stack slots that are not LLVM allocate instructions, which happens to be everything in our GC frame. So as soon as you have a variable in Julia that's in a GC frame, LLVM currently loses track of it, which is actually just a stupid limitation. Like it, There's absolutely no reason that it needs to do that, but uh, nobody has written the appropriate tracking capability yet. So uh, this, is, this is the Julia read function. You can see it's in a JIT object. This is LDB's JIT debugging capability, which I wrote, which was merged uh, on Tuesday. So if you have a recent master LLDB, you could see this. Um, but the best thing would probably just to wait for this to be all become more stable, and then it should be more seamless. So you can see this is the Julia read functions. It's at streamjl690. Uh, the only problem is we don't get Julia source code yet, but that is very easy to fix um, by just telling telling the debugger <coughs> where where all my base Julia code is. So I'm telling it it's in users k Fisher Julia app stream base. That's where all my code is. And now if I type f11 again, I actually see in my backtrace. So what I can do is like now that I have that, I can like navigate the call stack. Like we can see we in wait read nb. We went down one frame. It's in wait read nb, and then it's in stream wait. And that way you can navigate. Like it's 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 just regular debugger. Like to the debugger at this point, it doesn't matter if it's C or Julia. So with this, we can already do most of the kinds of debugging you would have in C, except for local variables and stack frames. But that's a an implementation detail. Um, and the reason why I went for this kind of approach as opposed to, say, a debugger as it might be understood in some other languages, such as uh, Elm's debugger, for example. You, you know the time traveling debugger that they can dra back, drag back and forth? I think that's really cool, and I think we should support it. But I think uh, in Julia, we need to take a slightly different approach because we interact with C, C libraries so much that you really want to be able to get down to this low level and then build on top of that to enable these more ca fancy ki kinds of debugging features that Elm has and also that I I'm really excited about like doing machine learning on program state and I, uh, a couple of people I know are also really interested. So once this is get, uh, gets going, that's uh, what I'll be doing. But, uh, so this is, uh, this is the approach that I've taken, basically machine level, um, Debugging, it has some disadvantages in that if it's actually optimized code, the debugger might not know where the variables is. And the way I'm hoping to get around that is, like, say, when you set a breakpoint or when you ask for a backtrace, basically dynamically recompile your Julia function, but with better debug tracking, which is not feasible to do in general because it's very slow in execution. But if it's only one function that specifically you're in a debugger, it actually makes sense. And the reason a lot of people don't do it is because they don't have the source code available. Um, but we have actually either the Julia AST, which we could recompile to LLVM, or the LLVM IR. We can keep track of that and just recompile it with a, like a lower optimization level. And actually, so I was afraid I was going to have to write all of this myself, but uh, the WebKit people now use LLVM for their last tier of um, their JavaScript engine. Which is very exciting because in JavaScript they actually need to do de-optimization because they can't do uh, types properly. So I'm just going to use all of that technology and put it in the Julia debugger in, instead because we do have types, but it's still helpful to do de-optimization, not because we can't optimize, but we might not want to optimize in a debugging context. Um, all right, so uh, this is that. One more thing I want to show off is uh, the ability to set breakpoints. So you can set breakpoints in Julia code. 
this is this is an inference. I always like stepping through inference because it has huge functions um, that are actually also not very efficiently compiled because it has a like it doesn't do a lot of it uses general Julia types rather than register values, so um, you can more easily step through it, and it doesn't do a lot of reorganizing. So uh, this is an inference.jl. So if I <coughs> restart the Julia process and just yes, uh, let's compile something. Sign that should hit inference. Yes. Okay. So the the only thing is like it didn't tell me it hit a breakpoint yet because that's some sort of asynchronous I/O that's going on in LDB that I haven't quite figured out yet. But if I actually go over here and do a backtrace now, uh, you can see you can see that it told me it hit breakpoint 1.11, which I specified as being in Julia code. So it actually figured out where in Julia code what function that is, and it set breakpoints in every single specialization of this function, and basically tells me it hit this uh, it hit this breakpoint in Julia code. So if you want to, you can. Um, yeah, so if you want to, you can uh, just look at inference code, which is actually really cool to figure out what inference is doing. Um, if you're interested in that, if you want to, after Jeff's Julia internals talk, want to have a look at what's happening, um, this is a cool way to do it. And you can actually, uh, I'm not going to demo it now because of the asynchronous I/O stuff. I'm not going to get any output, but you can step like you would in a debugger through Julia code, and it'll just work. Okay. So I, I'm glad this didn't crash. Uh, as I said, this was done this morning at 2 a.m. Um, and la last night on the boat. So that's what I was working on. If you were wondering why I was being asocial on the boat, I was trying to get this done. Uh, so if you didn't get a chance to talk to me, uh, catch me during lunch or something. All right, but so this was, this was the first demonstration. I mentioned briefly before that to do this, I have to call C++. And I can, but, but can just one point. I just yeah. Really, so DB stop if error equivalent. If you're familiar with MATLAB, I mean that'll just be equivalent to setting a breakpoint in JL, JL error. error. Right. Yeah, right. it absolutely works. Okay. Uh, right. I'm not gonna try demoing it because I don't know if it works. Right. right, right. <laughs> it probably does. Like I've, so I've obviously had some of this stuff in various levels of completeness for a while, and I've definitely set breakpoints in JL error and just stepped through the call trace and dumped various local variables. So it definitely works. I just don't know if it yeah. works right now, and if it doesn't, that'll waste a lot of time. Yeah. Um, so, but yes, definitely, DB stop and error is equivalent to setting a breakpoint in JL error. Great. And um, yeah. So, um, I mean, one thing we can already see here is that you can step in and out of Julia code. Oh yeah, it's fantastic. Which is cool. Um, I mean, one idea that just occurred to me is if you know that something is the value as a JL value T type, we could print it in. Oh no, certainly. So you're using the Julia show function. Yes, yeah, no, of absolutely. So my my idea is it's it's kind of tricky. Um, so I haven't talked about that because it isn't quite fleshed out yet, and I can't necessarily say if it'll work. But my idea is basically that I will have a programmatic way of referencing Julia values in the child process, and then if you like call show on that, it'll go and figure out which show method is the applicable one, and then we either co-gen the function in the child that's the appropriate show method. Like the problem might be that the show method isn't co-gen in the b process being debugged. Can you, can you call jail underscore? Oh, you something? certainly can. Yeah, let's, let's do it. Um, <laughs> okay, let's see. Uh, we need a function that's not recursive because if it's recursive, uh, a data structure that's not recursive because if it's recursive, it'll crash. Like, uh, let's just pick something. That's just f, fine. like that's, that's f sound good. Oh god, this is this is this is very nerve wracking. <laughs> okay, yeah. So I, I I had no idea if this would work, so I'm glad it did. Uh, so I, I this is the argument to Julia abstract call uh, f, and I call jl underscore, which is the debugger show method, and it t told me that it was a hash function. Do fr. You're really tempting fate here, Jeff. Show us my debugging abilities. Because jail underscore already exists. Okay, fine. F dash FRX. Okay. Anything else? Any other requests? I'm sure this is going to crash. 
I don't think we'll be satisfied until I crash. <laughs> 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 all right, uh, fine. I make it crash fast. <laughs> I mean, you can just like unsafe load zero and then it'll crash. Yeah, yeah. That's cheating. <laughs> Uh, what's the type thing for that when you were showing to me that like uh, the type that was the that was the I O that was some I O object that had a back reference to a condition which had a reference to a task which has which has a reference to the I O. So that's why I said don't print recursive objects with JR as well. But uh, so there's there's one more demo I actually want to get to. Uh, and I don't want to run too much over into lunch because people might hate you. You have plenty of time, you get twenty minutes. Oh okay. Um, I still have one demo though, and then we can get back to playing with this right after the demo. So I, I mentioned I mentioned that what I had to do was basically write a C++ interface. And obviously I wanted to talk about the debugger because that's important to a lot of people, but the C++ interface by itself is something very worthwhile, especially if you work uh, a lot with code that needs C++. And basically, okay, so let me do the demo first and then explain how it works. So I have this function. Uh, it's called code graph. It graphs a function, like the control flow graph function. And it uses LLVM to do it. <coughs> so this is how the how this debugger front end works internally. I have an at CPP macro, which basically takes a hybrid Julia C expression and then turns it into C. So, um, what this function is doing, it's, it's allocating a standard string, uh, passing it to an LLVM IO stream, getting the Julia function object for any function you pass in. Like it works like any of the other code underscore functions. Uh, then using LLVM to create a graph, and then returning that as a string. So uh, this is also the wrong prompt. Julia prompt, there we go. So th as I said, this is a full Julia prompt. And I'm actually expecting that once the debugger is more full functional, a lot of people will actually prefer to be at the Julia prompt to do a lot of the stuff rather than the debugger prompt. So I, I have code graph and I, I asked Jihao what he thought the, the one of the most complicated functions he could think of was and he said factorize. So I I want to show you the control flow graph of, of factorize. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> this <laughs> Is, is the control flow graph of factorize. I, uh, so usually LLVM can put LLVM instructions in there, but then it wouldn't fit on my terminal, so I didn't. So all of these boxes are uh, LLVM basic blocks, basically. And I, I, I use this kind of graph when doing like LLVM level debugging of optimizer bugs and compiler bugs to figure out exactly what reorganization is doing. So I actually, uh, th this function I actually had for a while because I use it um, to dump out the various optimization steps of Julia code. And I, eventually I'll make a talk where I show just exactly how to do that. But so at this point, I just want to use it as a convenient demo of, of the C++ code. Um, so the, the, uh, as I said, the way the C++ code is working is it's using Clang, which is actually very convenient because you can't actually call C++ without a C++ compiler. Uh, because C++, the C++ standard requires you to do code generation in the calling compilation unit rather than the called compilation unit, like basically C, C would do. So you have to do template instantiation, inline function instantiation, uh, and all that kind of stuff. So the way it works is basically, I have a multi-stage boot, uh, uh, bootstrap process. There's a small C++ core that basically exposes me some Clang functions, and then I'm calling Clang from Julia. So all the, the at CPP macro uh, I showed is actually written in Julia using an earlier stage version of the at CPP macro to call Clang to call itself. So uh, it's, it's kind of crazy, but it works beautifully. Uh, Jeff really doesn't like it. <laughs> Every time he sees this, he says you can't just randomly put a valid code generator and expect it to work, but uh, it works. So don't do it at all. You can totally put a valid code generator and expect it to work. Um, so the reason it's not published right now is because it's, it's kind of unstable because it, well, I'm it's hacking type inference to do this. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I'm hacking type inference to do this. Uh, and actually, the nice abstraction I want to use is staged functions, at which point it'll basically just work independent of what type inference says, and it'll probably not crash as much. 
because I know if you have if you, if it gets bad gets bad type information it will crash uh, or give an error in cases where I know it's bad type information that caused the crash. So uh, one thing I want to show off of how it works internally though is like um, uh, just like give a quick peek at the Clang internal data structures. So uh, I, I was allocating a standard string earlier. Uh, so basically, what this this is a C++ lookup call, and it returned me a Clang internal decal structure, which is basically just uh, an element of Clang's AST. And I can uh, I can dump I can dump this, and this is Whoa. this is. Yeah, okay, so here's the other color, colorful part. This is Clang's internal internal AST that I'm basically working on. So I'm basically what I'm doing is I'm using Clang to parse all the headers for all of LLVM, Clang, and LLDB, and then just using Clang itself again to do appropriate code generation from whatever I tell it to do from Julia. And at first I thought it was it was kind of marginal, but I actually really like it because. Um, before, when I had to do things in, in LLVM, I would write like a C wrapper function and then figure out what the right uh, arguments are and everything like that. But right now, it's like, I, I for example, I had to iterate over all the parameters and I was about to write a C wrapper and then I figured, oh, my C++ wrapper can actually do that. So if you can, you can write a range that's like from one to at C++ <coughs> param length, right? And it'll just work. Like embedding, it's, it's kind of the two language problem, but like, take, uh, 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 yeah, it, it's the two language problem all over again. And I think in Julia we have a strong tradition of actually being able to embed with other languages. Namely, at first we have C, which is very easy to call through C call. And then we have PyCall, which is very easy, uh, which is very easy to use as well, and everybody uses it. The, the thing we didn't have so far is C++ because it's hard. But this actually makes it extremely easy to call C++. And I'm going to keep working on this and hopefully it's going to be useful for people who need to call C++. Um, and no other language has this. Like, interfacing with C++ is an extremely hard problem. And basically, no other language can do it. And the only reason we can do it in Julia is because uh, we're extremely flexible in what we can express. So uh, this is up and coming. Uh, this is kind of two talks crammed into one and only. Uh, marginal details of both. So if you want details, come talk to me. I'm happy to list any details and probably at next year's JuliaCon I'm going to have a talk that's the Julia debugger and it works now. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I wanted to give this talk because I, um, just to tell people what I'm up to and to show that it's coming because people have been asking for it. So I apologize for all the crashing earlier, but that's what I have and I'll, I'll keep working on that. So I, I can take a couple of questions and I can talk about it. How far along are we to a CPP call? I mean, <laughs> this, this is it. This is it. This is it. This is it. Did that call a function or did it just generate like a wrapper? Yeah, no, it, it called a function. function. Like it, it, it did the C++. OK, I didn't understand. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. OK, I'll, I'll explain better. So uh, can you show the code for it a little bit? Do you really want to see it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I'll explain. I'll explain exactly what this is doing, and then I'll I'll show the code. But if you if you don't understand the code that I'm going to show you, then, uh, don't worry. Like it's going to be cleaned up, and it's going to be rather nice. So no. So what this is actually doing is it's looking up in C plus plus land what standard string means. So the standard string is actually a templated standard underscore underscore one basic string templated on on on, on car. So it, uh, it deals with template arguments. So this is actually, uh, this week I basically made it almost fully functional. Like I can do temp template instantiation. Um, I can, uh, I'm doing proper C++ method resolution. Like if you call an overloaded C++ function, it'll look at the Julia types, see which one cause, like it, it'll do a proper C++ Julia type mapping of some sort. Um, I mean, most of the time, you'll have a pointer, like a CPP pointer, that just wraps a C++ pointer, and then they'll do the method re uh, resolution in that C++ class. But uh, Julia built-ins, uh, like ints and pools and that kind of thing, it'll automatically translate into C++ land. So yeah, no, this is, uh, actually, the, the C++ call stuff is a lot more functional than you might think. 
The only problem is it's currently a pain to write because every time you make a syntax error, it'll not tell you you made a syntax error, but it'll either crash or tell you it got bad type information. Uh, as I said, because I'm hacking type inference. As soon as I'm uh, changing that, so it's a nicer interface, I can probably, uh, like people can probably start using that. So yeah, so it's, it's, uh, it's allocating a standard string, it's allocating an LLVM raw stream. It's not generating any wrappers, it's like directly inlining it into the Julia function. Like this, is, this is as efficient as calling a C++ function in C++. Um, yes? So you have right, you know, at C++ and yeah. then you write some code that actually looks like it could either be C++ or Julia. No, it is, it is Julia. Right, so what's the mapping between C++ syntax and Julia syntax? I mean, so in C call, we just ignore that. We don't, right. there is no syntax. Right. It's like, here, um, here are the types, here are the arguments. This looks like it has syntax before it can be It, it kind of does. I'm not quite sure what the right syntax is. Maybe it'll eventually just be strings. This looks pretty reasonable, really. I mean, it does look reasonable, but whenever I don't know what the, okay, the so rules are. The, the, semantics, the semantics are very easy. Basically, at CPP only operates on like the thing that's right next to it that looks like a C++. That's like the... the <laughs> Shoving it under the carpet it looks like a C++. No, no, no. <laughs> it's, it, it, there's, there's four rules. Like it's either like a, a namespace specifier um, like this. Okay. So it, uh, until the next opening parentheses. That's what's interpre interpreted as C++. Down here, like I'm, I'm using the anonymous function syntax for the C++ method calls. So. Uh, it's either an, an, until an opening parenthesis, or that, yeah, it's, actually it's always until an opening parenthesis unless there's none. Uh, like you can reference a C++ value just by omitting, like if it's not a function, you can still reference it, like a C++ global, global variable. Um, the, the angle brackets are curly brackets, I guess. Oh yes, yes, yeah, okay, so Jake wanted to see the, sh uh, Jake wanted to uh, see the code, so I, I will show some of the code. And well, you just have a lot more in C++ code. I, I have a lot of C++ code <laughs> in the C++ code. Uh, okay, let me make this bigger. Command plus should do it. Why is it so slow? Probably because you know, the debugger is doing something horrible when I do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're probably right about that. <laughs> okay. So yeah, this is some of the like, this is actually where I'm creating the, the debugger, so. Yeah, yeah I, I'm working on it. It's, it's, see see the, the, the spinning beach ball? It's, it's working. Uh, so, yeah, okay. Uh, can people see it now? So this code is ugly. I didn't intend to show this code. And it's probably the most ugly code I've ever written. So uh, if you're watching this on camera, this is not what I usually <laughs> Uh, yeah, so you can, you can actually see right like down here is actually where I'm initializing the debugger. Like I'm, I'm actually just like calling LDB private debugger initialize. So I'm not cheating by using the LDB C++, uh, C++ uh, C uh, API that grabs the. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, did Jeff leave? He was asking about. I was asking about curly braces. Yes, curly braces are template. Template. So that's the that's the other piece of syntax. Like array ref is parameterized on a LLVM type star. So this this basically says like uh, construct an LLVM array ref parameterized on uh, uh, PCPP means a pointer to C plus plus. Like it's it's a I have four macros that basically represent the type. So PCPP is a pointer to the C++ type LLVM type. So that's how you express uh, that's how you express templates. And then I'm just passing in a whole bunch of code. Um, this function is especially ugly because it actually does code gen. So it actually, I'm calling a like create calls manually to Julia functions because I need to create it. Uh, I need to do some allocation because, it, it, as I said, it's a hack to get around type. But that's going to be cleaned up. Why do you have CPP2 and CPP3? It's <laughs> like lined up, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm doing a bootstrap. There's a, oh. it's there's uh, currently four versions of the CPP macro. <laughs> I'm hoping to cut it down to two. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
Um, basically, every CPP macro like handles more of C++. So the C++ one macro like makes a bunch of assumptions on if it's an say an integer return type, it's always an in64. And it just happens to hold true for all the functions I'm using to write the CPP2 macro. And then like the CPP4 macro actually <laughs> covers all of C++. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, this is amazing, amazing stuff. Um, I, I'm not, the debugger is probably a bigger deal than being able to call C++ as a key as you need to. And yeah. of course, they're intricately intro related. Um, will, I, I know you, it's two separate processes, right? Yeah. So you're debugging one process with the other. You can continue to be the way? Uh, L is right. it's, it's a good question. Um, I am not sure yet. It probably depends on how we do multi-thread support and Julia because you really don't want to uh, uh, change the stack on the main thread that we're currently on. So if we can like have the debugger running the debugger prompt, like the, the prompt is the problem. Like LLDB, the backend itself. Right, something has you're, you're debugging some code which is running. Right. With some other code which also has to be running. Right. And we if we're currently copy one stack. There's only one place where the stack is, and right. so which right. stack is actually right. Works. And you, you, you're not like uh, while you're debugging, you can't switch to a different task. Yeah. So if we if we get appropriate multi-thread support, you can debug the current process, um, and that's that's basically the plan. The the other thing is you can actually just like behind the user's back start a Julia debugger process yeah, yeah, and just give it control of the prompt. It just doesn't look like a different process, and it just doesn't look like a different process. And LLDB behind your back starts a process to get around the code signing issue. Right. So does GDB do the same thing? GDB you have to sign. No, I mean, but G GDB oh. have a separate process. When GDB no, GDB does not use the. So I, I don't know. I mean, so I, I have some idea of why they did it. Like they wanted one process that handles both local and remote connections for debugging, um, and that's the one that's like code signed to be able to take control of other processes. It just makes it kind of funny because. You can have any process on your local machine can basically talk to the LLDB codes uh, to the code signed like server and just take control of any process in the system. So <laughs> it's it's kind of funny. I, I I understand why they did it that way. Um, but yeah, so I, I'm I'm just using that. Um, oh yeah, uh, Jeff, you were asking about curly uh, curlies. So here's a template expression. Yes. Can you say more about the de-optimization? Because it sounds like like you uh, pause the process and then you have to like, go in and slip out functions in the stack trace and yeah. line so up all the variables. That's right. It sounds very complicated. It's kind of complicated, but the good thing is that actually the hard work has been done for us by the JavaScript people. Like that's that's why I mentioned JavaScript. JavaScript needs to do this routinely when they like mispredicted what the correct type is. So they added support for this in LLVM. It's called uh, stack maps. Basically, what you do is you locate. Uh, so you, the, the good thing is you only ever really need to sh uh, switch out functions at call boundaries. So what you do is you, uh, uh, in the, uh, you basically, during code generation, keep track of where all of your local variables are and efficiently save that in some sort of map. And then you can basically just swap out the function and reassign the, the stack slots. It totally works. Like I've used this with non Julia code, um, so that that's probably what I'm going to be doing. I mean, this is this is like a thirty-five year old technique. Yeah. It's, so yeah. it's crazy, but it's you know it, it's, it's crazy, but it, many, it works. Times. And it, it allows you to basically run release code and still probably get a nice debugger. But at least that's what I'm hoping. Like I, I didn't talk about it really because I don't know if it'll work yet. I'm expecting that it will, but I can't promise that it will. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to be working on this for the rest of the summer and probably many years thereafter. <laughs> 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 this, is, this is what I have currently. And the, the front end is going to improve rapidly. Like I started working on the front end, uh, like the, the stuff that I demoed today, on the plane on Wednesday, and finished it this morning at 2 AM. So the back end stuff is what you should really take away from what I've been doing of the past year, rather than the front end stuff that's kind of crashy and kind of messed up. So, you know, do, do you think like, that the optimization internals that you have to make, do to make this work, would that be used in other places in Julia to like, basically assume a stricter type than you can normally infer, and then de-optimize when you get that point? Um, 
Theoretically, yes. Yeah. Uh, it, I mean, it's it's a common trick in the dynamic languages. Yeah, that's playbook, what they do. Right? Yeah, like, if you if you don't have the kind of good type system that we do, and you can't do the kind of type inference that we do, that's basically what you have to do. Yeah. Like, that's that's how all of the. That's awesome. like, there's yes. sort of this conflation of JIT with exactly that sort of technique. Exactly. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's very hard, but it, it, it might be worthwhile. And I'm gonna implement it in, in Julia and we'll 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 see how it works, right? Yeah, yeah. If it if it's stable enough to be routinely used. My what my one worry is that it'll like obfuscate kinda of what code is fast and what code is slow because it'll just randomly like well, if everything is fast then people will forgive you. <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a fair point. So yes. Yeah, we might well, be able I, I to agree it's not intuitive, right? Because you're not strict mapping right. anymore. I mean, we we might be able to leverage more of the fancy dynamic languages techniques. Um, right now I'm only targeting it for a debugger because in a debugger it's kinda you're allowed to be a little more experimental than in your actual code gen and like if you don't want to use any of the fancy debugging features and want just want to step through your code, like it's guaranteed to just work. Rather than like giving you subtle bugs in Oh yeah. yeah. Just work. yeah. But yes, it's possible. Our yeah. We should we should yeah, we should move on. Oh, we should move on. Okay. Okay. Yeah, find me at lunch or something. Yeah. Alright. That was Thanks, awesome.